Welcome to politics in the pub. It's obvious that we should have tried, which we did, to find a slightly bigger venue, but this is a cosy, important uh, venue for politics in the pub. And uh, long may it go on because public forums like this in the present state of affairs in Australia are absolutely imperative. Um, we want to welcome John, who really is one of the uh, perhaps the bravest, the most significant filmmaker, journalist, author, critic uh, that uh, Australia can be. Uh, up to 20 uh, films, documentaries, I've probably got my mental arithmetic slightly incorrect, as many books. So welcome to Politics in the Pub and a particular welcome to John. <laughs> I want to start the conversation with two particular dates in mind to John. One is 2009 when he won the very significant Sydney Peace Prize and followed in the steps of people like uh, Archbishop Tutu, Mary Robinson, Bill Dean, Patrick Dodson, uh, Hans Blix and uh, Aaron Darty Roy and the wonderful Palestinian leader Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. So that's one date. The other date I have in mind, John, is 1821, almost 200 years before that, when uh, another significant person arrived in Australia, but in leg irons from, um, from Ireland. Uh, your great, great, great grandfather uh, to be punished for uh, insurrection and uttering unlawful oaths. <laughs> Now, I mean, John has been uttering unlawful oaths uh, for, for over 70 years. I just wonder if you think the, the legacy of that great, great grandfather has given you the guts and the skills to do what you do. Well, I think uh, it's interesting. The, the uttering unlawful oaths is the same uh, 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 charge that the, the, the 12 puddle martyrs. Got, but I think uh, Francis McCarthy, who is my great 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 grandfather, was merely objecting to starving to death, uh, as a lot of Irish people then were. Um, and uh, his, I, I traced his uh, his his uh, the records of his trial in Cork, and he did make uh, quite a spirited speech about. Uh, not going to Australia, which I thought was quite significant. Um, but he did go, and uh, the, the good news that was he married another convict, uh, um, Mary Palmer, the two of them lived incredibly to almost 90, and had uh, about uh, a dozen uh, children, several of whom died, but the fact that they survived was quite extraordinary. She arrived at the age of uh, 17. She was only, she was uh, called a, um, a prostitute uh, in the trial uh, report in the London Gazette. She was uh, an Irish uh, below stairs uh, woman uh, and uh, was sacked from a number of jobs. She went on the streets as part of a, an all-female gang. They used to rob their, um, their prospective clients before any transaction could happen. Uh, I thought and, they did it afterwards, John. Uh, well, they may have done it afterwards or not, but anyway, poor Mary, she, she ended up, she was only spared the noose at Newgate Prison because she was pregnant. And the extraordinary thing is both of them survived the trip out. So that's, that's the history. How much of that has dripped down uh, to me, I don't know. But uh, I must say, I'm, if we can be proud of a bit of history, I'm, I think I'm proud of them both. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's switch to somebody who has been incarcerated in a way for almost four years now, for also, at least metaphorically, uttering unlawful oaths on our behalf, Julian Assange. You've written almost optimistically in the past few days that this might be the end of the road, the findings yeah. by the UN, um, the, the special panel. Are you, are you really confident that that could be the end of the road? 
No, I'm not too confident, Stuart. Uh, but I think it is the beginning of the beginning. This judgment, this decision by the United Nations Working Group on arbitrary detention is very, very significant. They've only made five decisions in the years they've been going. They've been going almost 20 years, and all of them have been highly significant. The decision has been adhered to by most of the governments of the world. They made Aung San Suu Kyi the celebrated dissident in many ways that she wasn't before their judgment, although they didn't change the mind of the dictatorship in Burma. They stood up for a Washington Post reporter in Iran who was detained. They, yes, they stood up for Ibrahim, the opposition leader of Malaysia, and so on. So it's very significant. And what was also significant was the reaction of particularly the British government. This thug, and I think thug is the proper word for the present foreign secretary, who came out and described the, the decision as ridiculous. Now this is someone who, whose government has supported every decision made by the working group, who contributed considerably to the, the evidence of the working group, who went along with it, uh, although they tried to pressure the decision uh, when they knew it was going to go against them. So it is, it, 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 no they don't have, the UN doesn't have the power to go and free Julian from the Ecuador Embassy in, uh, in London, but you know things move even at a glacial pace. The British government cannot ignore this. And I think it is the beginning of a deal being done. There's a vacuum. What, what great states, great imperial states hate is a vacuum. And a vacuum exists right in the heart of London, next to Harrods. They've got somebody there who has defied them, who is a fully credited dissident. He, he has the world virtually officially now on his side. They will have to resolve it. I think there will be a deal that uh, in the middle of the night, maybe, this is a guess, in the middle of the night, Julian will be given free passage out of the UK to Ecuador. I hope that will happen. A lot of the correspondence, even in social media, seems to still want to imply that the issue is about uh, potential sexual assault charges. Whereas you've actually written several times that the issue about Julian Assange concerns a Pentagon-dominated Washington. Well, there are no charges, Stuart. There have never been any charges. There have never been any specific allegations. The whole thing is a grotesque farce. Uh, one of the women involved has said that the police tried to railroad her, that's the word she used, that they fabricated the evidence. Neither of them said there was any rape, and the first prosecutor made it very clear, and I can't quote her exactly, but she said words to the effect, there is no evidence whatsoever of any rape, and she dismissed it. She was the chief prosecutor in, in Stockholm. In comes a second prosecutor, brought in by a politician, a very ambitious politician. This prosecutor has succeeded in stalling, installing this case and almost putting it in a freezer for the last five years. She's refused to interview Julian. She refused to interview him. He hung around in, in Sweden for five weeks. And she refused to interview him. Then he asked her permission. Please can I go to London because I have to release the Iraq war logs and the, and the Guardian. They gave him permission. The moment he arrived in London, they, there was an Interpol red alert for him. I mean, there is the dreadful expression, you couldn't make it up, but there is a lot about this that you couldn't make up. And then she's under, under Swedish regulations, she's, she's meant to interview this person again who's been charged with nothing, uh, there's every facility in London for her to interview Julian. And she's refused to. So the, the, what, what the 
the sexual, so-called sexual misconduct side of this has been an absolute gift to the propagandists. The media has played the most pernicious role in smearing Julian Assange. Uh, even the paper that, uh, that printed quite uh, a lot of the WikiLeaks disclosures, the Guardian newspaper, has run virtually a vendetta over the years against Julian. Uh, what this is about is a whistleblower. The administration in the United States, the Obama administration, has conducted a war on whistleblowers. Unlike any other administration, George W. Bush didn't pursue a, a single significant whistleblower. He could have, but he didn't. Obama, right at the beginning, said, uh, as a professor of constitutional law, I stand by whistleblowers, and then proceeded to prosecute more whistleblowers than any president in the history of the United States. Julian and WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden and others are regarded as enemies in a Washington that is dominated, dominated by the Pentagon, by the military. That's what this is about. And an indictment has been brought down, a secret indictment, has been brought down in Alexandra, Virginia, that is waiting for Julia. They've had to concoct a prosecution because, as Obama himself has pointed out, under the US Constitution, whistleblowing is perfectly legal. In fact, it's protected. Well, uh, we're on that. Let's drift into the Australia's uh, fascination wheel in deference to Washington. I think elsewhere, you've written about what seems to be, in, I think you called it an accelerating fascism in, in American politics, which, mm -hmm. uh, to which uh, we apparently condone. Um, is, can you say what you mean by this? Is that a reference to the clowns who are competing to be president on the Republican side? <laughs> what, what, what is this uh, accelerating fascism? Well, I think, I think those competing to be president distract us. They provide a theater every four years. And I've, con I've reported uh, on a number of US electoral campaigns, and they're a lot of fun. You know, you get characters like Donald Trump, <laughs> Richard Nixon, people who end up becoming president of the United States. Then you get the first African-American president in the land of slavery. Gosh, isn't that wonderful? What then? Well, he's like all the others, no surprise. So it's a system that has gone through a number of stages. I think, Stuart, following 9-11, uh, a lot changed. A lot was in um, ready to change. And the, there was almost a kind of silent coup d'etat in Washington by the military, by the Pentagon. There weren't tanks in the streets, no. But you find in the State Department there are the, the Pentagon's people now effectively are in charge of the administration. The present Defense Secretary uh, like all the previous defense secretaries, is really speaking for the military. In the State Department, which was meant to be the center of American diplomacy uh, and some kind of international statecraft, now speaks for a militarized foreign policy. And so do we in Australia. We copy everything. We copy it. This is copy country. We, we copy everything. We even copy, John Howard even had a little flag in his lapel because the American president had a flag in the lapel. When our, when our uh, politicians and uh, various military people have some sort of ceremony, they put their hand on their heart, just like they do in the US of A. We copy. And I don't want to trivialize this because the copying is very serious, because our military people are integrated. 
in the U.S. military. They go to the U.S. They're integrated. They, they are lobotomized, if you like, within a U.S. system. It's not as it used to be, oh, the Yanks are good because they saved us during the Second World War and we're on their side and the Russians are bad and they're good. It's much more than that now. We are part of it. We, we are genuinely, as so many people have called us, the 51st state. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very, very significant <coughs> change. And it really, do, like the US, it doesn't matter, yeah. really, that we're, who's, who's the prime minister. I mean, it's good not to have a, a fully accredited moron as prime minister, <laughs> as the last one clearly was. This one is not. This one is not, which makes it even more significant and cynical. <clears throat> one of your predecessors sitting where you are now was the late Malcolm Fraser, who came to talk about ending, in, in some ways in similar words to the, what you've used, ending this dependence on America. That if, uh, he argued here, that if Australia wanted to generate a sense of I, I 21st century identity and self-respect, we should cease the uncritical worship of Anzac Cove and Gallipoli, and instead do, as one of the significant people in this audience that, uh, has done, argue to get the, um, uh, to not have a, a marine bases in Australia. So, um, uh, are you going to agree with Malcolm yeah. Fraser? Well, it, it is, doesn't that say so much, uh, Stuart? You know, um, you know, um, R.I.P. Malcolm Fraser. He did good things in the last part of his life. But it comes down to a conservative prime minister to be the almost the leading um, spokesman of good sense, good sense in, in, in the country. Of course, not from the Labour Party. We've, we have virtually no one, no one of any kind of equivalent stature as Ma Malcolm Fraser to, to speak up, because the Labour Party is so up to its neck in the uh, whole US-Australia uh, arrangement, the vassal, the vassal state that Australia has, has become. It's, it's, it's a particular tragedy because I don't think there's another, I don't think there's another state quite with the same colonized mentality at so many levels, at the level of indigenous people, treatment of indigenous people, at the level of its place in the world as Australia. New Zealand is way, New Zealand is way ahead of us. New Zealand is way ahead of us. The United States itself, another settler state, is way ahead of us on so many levels. So is Canada. So is South Africa in many ways. The country whose apartheid, our Queensland, the policies towards indigenous people in Queensland, we, as, we inspired. But even they, this is a political country in South Africa with a, with a, with a robust debate, There's a lot wrong there, but it has a robust debate about itself. But we go along, we go along with with the master. It's a, it's a, I don't, I don't know how to describe it because all the words seem trite, but shaming is probably the one. Yeah. Um, in the struggle to establish a different and more uh, visionary, socially just Australian identity, and you've hinted at the issue already, it concerns the first Australians. Yeah. You made a film, I think about a year ago or two years ago, which had widespread coverage and the huge criticism from the conservative wing uh, called Utopia. I, and, and of course this week, oh, was it a couple of days ago, the report that we failed to close the gap and there's hardly any uh, indication that uh, the mortality rates or the morbidity rates of uh, indigenous people are getting any better. If you were to go back in 10 years time and make Utopia 2, what would have to change to make to enable you to make 
a much more optimistic uh, film and picture. But, but, but Stuart, um, the film Utopia I made came after several films I've made on Indigenous <coughs> Australia. The first was made in 1985 called The Secret Country. And I made the point when I was talking about Utopia that in the editing room we confused the footage that we shot and the interviews that we shot in 1985 with the film that we were producing, a contemporary film. Nothing basically has changed. Yes, yes, a small educated class, a class that can be easily manipulated, a class that often colludes with the, with the, the powers that be in this country. That has grown up among indigenous people and amongst that educated class there are some very impressive people. Yes, there are some, as there always has been actually, but now there are perhaps more of the most brilliant activists. You talk about optimism. I thought Utopia was a very optimistic film because it brought out some of the most inspiring indigenous people that, that very few people in this country know anything about. People who have fought in a very eloquent way, in a very courageous way, but have been denied any kind of real recognition both by the government um, and, and, uh, and in the media. Um, and a media and a government that erects its Aboriginal, it's acceptable Aboriginal spokesman and calls them a leader like Noel Pearson. Noel Pearson is the leader. Well, he's not the leader actually. He runs a very small part of Indigenous Australia, but you read nothing but Noel Pearson, Noel Pearson and those like him. I don't want to go into a criticism of Noel Pearson himself, but that's what's changed. But the, the, as far as the condition of Aboriginal people in this country is concerned, we only had to read and, read, and you mentioned the, this annual act of cynicism called Closing the Gap. There was a, a rare article in the Herald this morning, and I'm sorry I've forgotten the name of the author. Simpson. 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 And he made the point, he made the very good point, that there was nothing about nutrition, e even in the original Closing the Gap. And I, what I've found every time I've gone into Indigenous Australia is starvation, malnutrition. People, a doctor telling me they can't prescribe antibiotics or some kind of, or life, another form of life-saving medication because their patient hasn't got enough food in them to ingest it. That's in modern Australia, but the world knows that. That's what's changed as well, Stuart, that the world does know it now. Australia is on the nose as far as treatment of indigenous people. It used not to be. People were quite ignorant. They didn't know. It didn't get out. But now, from everybody has been here, amnesty, the United Nations, uh, um, human rights people, the refugees people, um, the, the uh, special reporter of the United Nations uh, uh, has report after report describing Australia in terms that used to describe Australia. No other country has had more United Nations reports accusing it of racism than in recent years than this country. Isn't that something? That, 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 that is what hasn't changed. That is what haven't, hasn't changed. And here we read Turnbull going through the same cynical exercise. He's going to put through a referendum in which uh, the, uh, we're going to recognize indigenous people in the Constitution. Most indigenous people, and I think it's fair to say, couldn't give a damn about this. What they want is a treaty. 
what they want is to sit down with as equals, at least as equals, with the ruling body in this country and have treaties in health, in education, in law, in welfare, in all the areas in which they are so deprived and, and which they're so denied. The idea that they get a few words in the Constitution, which Australians go and vote on in a referendum begrudgingly, is a joke. It's a bad joke. John, I want to make a bit of a, a leap here, but I want to talk, I want to have an exchange with you about another indigenous people that both of us care a great deal about, and it concerns two other dates, 1788 and 1948. It concerns the idea that 1788 is about an empty land, the terra nullius doctrine, and 1948 is the claims of Golden Meir about uh, the Palestinians' land, that this was a land without a people for a people without a land. Yeah. At the moment, summary executions occur every day of any young Palestinian who even looks slightly suspicious and, and nobody is being held accountable. Only one brave foreign minister from Sweden has asked at least for an international inquiry, but no other politician, certainly nobody who lives or works in Canberra, has, has, uh, has said a word. Can, we, can, you, can you switch your mind to the yeah. terrible cruelty towards the people of Palestine? Well, they're, they're related, aren't they? These are the indigenous people of Palestine. The indigenous people of Australia, they have much in common in the way they're treated until recently, uh, executing the uh, indigenous people of Australia wasn't all that uncommon. Now they die in, uh, in out, of, out of sight in prison cells and and uh, or from diabetes and 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 so on. So the two are connected, uh, Stuart. But you're absolutely right to raise it. I think you know there are there are a number of issues. I suppose is the word that are a litmus tests of whether we're fully fledged human beings or not. Palestine is one of them. Palestine is one of them. Uh, another is, in my view, the indigenous situation in Australia. But Palestine, where you rightly point out, there's now uh, extrajudicial executions now are carried on daily. Um, you, you, you can only, you can read them, they're, they're not news anymore. They happen, three or four of them, and they include children. The, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that, that, that in Gaza is still, the, the assault that took place on Gaza two years ago, leaving that, that uh, perceived society in ruins, that nothing has happened from the outside world, apart from people like you speaking up and people um, like uh, uh, the various UN uh, reporters and good NGOs and words of uh, sympathy murmured from certain journalists. Otherwise, nothing has sure. happened. Can I just refer to the issue of, of, of courage in public life in regard to this issue and uh, because I was discussing it with some significant politicians, I think, earlier today. Because it seems to me the closer you get to Canberra, the more courage diminishes. <laughs> then there's a sense, there's a sense of fear. Uh, there's that sort of what they said it was merely risk aversion. That's what they told me. Um, not wishing to take a risk. It seems to me, if you want your life to be mon monumentally boring and irrelevant, you you spend your time trying to avoid risks. Uh, because you, you've, not you've not found or practiced the courage to take the stands that are absolutely required by everybody in this room and beyond on these sorts of issues. Yeah, well, that's right. But look at look the, the, uh, the pro-Israel lobby, Zionist lobby, call it what you want, is so entrenched. I mean, you think it's entrenched in the United States or even in the United Kingdom. But... You know, le leading journalists quite openly um, take the shilling and off they go to Israel to really 
report what they're shown and what they're told. Uh, where is the dissent of any kind in, in Canada? Uh, where is there a kind of acknowledgement of one of the great successes that we should be optimistic about, and that is the boycott and disinvestment movement, the BDS movement. Um, I, every time I read their, their bulletin from this amazing man, uh, Omar Baghouti, one of the equally amazing Baghouti family, um, but uh, 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 telling us of the latest achievement and governments and around the world, universities, universities in California, University of Los Angeles, disinvesting, disinvesting. It's such good news. It's good news for, for justice. And yet, of course, we hear nothing of it because we, we, we don't, unless, unless we take the trouble, and it's not all that much trouble to find out, but it is one achievement after the other of BDS. And I am actually, it's, it seems amazing to say, but even a bit optimistic yeah, about, sure. about yeah. Palestine, sure. yeah. that, that the Palestinians will get there, will get there. They may not get there for, a, for quite a while, but they will get there. The world, so many in the world, are behind them. I think one can't underestimate the business of education, even explaining what BDS means, because I was at a seminar in a very privileged part of, of uh, Sydney uh, yesterday evening. Uh, I won't say where it is, but it's just on Military Road. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody said, that we, what is BDS? Uh -huh. So, uh, but while right, you, made, you made a reference to justice, which and we really ought to have a quick exchange about the predicament, worse than the fate, of 267 people, including I think 37 babies, whom in order to demonstrate how strong we are, the government wishes to send back to Manus Island and Nauru. Seems to me that this policy is born of a fascination with violence to uh, control the most vulnerable, to hold them, uh, to ransom, to teach them a lesson, and to uh, conduct this absurd charade that the reason for the massive movement of peoples around the world, particularly across Europe, is caused by people smugglers. Yeah. <laughs> but they're all connected, aren't they? <laughs> Everybody knows those to whom you're referring. Um, it beggars belief that those calling themselves High Court judges, High Court judges, oh, that sounds important, sounds respectable, doesn't it? Read summaries of their judgments except one. Who, sending these people, including all these babies, it's so bad that the Sydney Morning Herald has been forced in almost to become a campaigning newspaper, publishing, publishing pictures of these poor children, these infants, all, all over its front page. But we know this. This is a privileged society. We have access to sources of information. And I remember at a... Um, we organized it together, of course, Stuart, at the town hall. When breaking, Jul breaking when the silence. When, Ju when Julian Burnside turned round, the winner of the Sydney Peace Prize, and turned round and pointed at the audience and said, what are you doing about it? Because the truth is that, that politics in Australia are, more, are the politics, are mortuary politics. To call them a joke is to trivialize it, but they are the darkest joke, the darkest joke. And we have to go through these games that are played by people who don't even approach the threshold of courage, Stuart, their, 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 their information, what they tell us, what they are said to represent, they are, they are, they they there isn't a single politician, not a single politician, uh, unless I've missed them, I may have been away for a day or so, 
not a single politician that carries the respect, the basic respect and humanity that should come with this society. And this is a society that is meant to have inherited, what, the Enlightenment, is it? And uh, all those things that have come with uh, 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 the... the, the uh, uh, but, but, but none of it. Any other country, you will find, you'll, you'll get depressed about their politics politicians and oh it's good to laugh at American politicians well I don't think we should laugh at them I think we should look at our own because until we do something about politics as it's played as the game is played in Australia Stuart you and I will sit here and tick off all these atrocious events and that really should stop I, I, we're going to finish this by, I think, possibly a reference to the media, and then, of course, we ought to uh, um, uh, write the rest in peace epitaph of the ALP. But um, uh, you've got the. No, I, I, just object, I object to the rest in peace. <laughs> uh, you've just given an, a somewhat surprising compliment to the Sydney Morning Herald, and I want to. Sorry. I want to ask you about the career that you've been involved in for decades and decades as a, as a professional journalist. You've written somewhere else that um, Australia is not a democracy, it is a murdocracy. And you don't, uh, you, you don't seem to have any faith in your fellow journalists. Um, oh, I do. I have, I have every faith. I'm such a... I'm such a a pathetic, optimistic creature. Uh, I have faith in my own craft of journalism. And I, I could sit here and name some of the finest journalists. Not too many of them are Australian, there's a couple. Uh, who, most of whom I, you probably haven't heard of. So, uh, but as far as the Australian media, the system of media in this country. It's an extension of, of the political establishment. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not there to inform. There is a, a facade, it's like a wall. And this, this doesn't only apply in Australia, it applies right across in so-called free societies uh, where um, who was it, Richard Crossman, who once said that, you know, propaganda is, is only at its best when you don't know it's propaganda. And propaganda in Western societies is the most potent and powerful uh, of all time, in my view. How could it get away with convincing people who have certain freedoms uh, that certain lies are actually the truth? It's just absurd. So there is a wall. This wall is is erected by um, well, Murdoch owns seventy percent of the newspapers in this country. Uh, but then I did call it a Murdochracy. But it's the spirit of Murdoch. It's, he doesn't have to own everything because Murdochism and what that represents. And what it represents is a contempt for you as people wanting to find out, wanting to make the sense of the world. That runs right through the media and it includes the ABC. Do you think we need, do you think we need uh, in terms of the social media, some people are um, optimistic about the possible influence of that. I mean, and that implies that we could do with 20 more Chris Grahams from New Matilda and 20 more Wendy Bacons? Uh, you know, social media is okay. I, I, don't, I think relying on social media is, is relying on a, on a mirage in many ways. It's like relying on Facebook to give us a barometer of, of what is happening. It's, it's how many tweets we can send to each other. The truth is, most social media uh, we used to talk about ourselves. Social media uh, has allowed us to, has allowed so-called identity politics. 
has helped to actually, in my view, disconnect us. Look at the people going up and down Pitt Street. Look at them. All the time. There was a very good cartoon someone sent me the other day, and he imagined they all had books. <laughs> and it was a wonderful picture. They were all reading books and kind of dodging each other. But now, we've become, in many ways, digital slaves. We're besotted, we're addicted. That doesn't mean to say that the, the digital era doesn't present fabulous opportunities to finding out about other people's injustices and so on. But it traps us as well. It immobilizes many of us. It stops us coming together meetings like this. This is anti-digital. This is anti-digital. Could, 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 meet... could everybody switch their mobile phones off? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is because we've come together to have a talk, to throw around a few ideas. Sorry? I found out about it through Facebook. That's right. Okay, well you would have what, you, are you saying you wouldn't have found out about it otherwise? Probably. Yep. Really? That's sad. Okay, let's, uh, let's try and see if we can give a massive blood transfusion to the ALB before we break for the collection talk. In, in 19, 30 years ago, John, you wrote one of your uh, most popular books. It was called Heroes. And the heroes, I, when I picked it up initially, I thought, oh, it's going to be about John F. Kennedy and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and so on. Um, but in fact, it was about ordinary people. You referred, I think, to uh, Irish working class people, among others. And because um, you went on to say that the values that they held uh, should have, I mean, you seem to imply that that's what should infuse and motivate the ALP, if it was true to its sources, true to the people who, who founded it. No, Stuart, I think the ALP is a write-off. I, I, know you, I, know, I, I, know you, I know you want to drag it out of the grave, and brush it down and respect the skeleton, but sorry, can't do that. Can't do that. Oh, okay, well, that's, uh, well, that's the end of the meeting. <laughs>